Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Boost Your Biology podcast. Today's special guest is the medical director at Merrick Health. He's a wealth of knowledge when it comes to all things hormone optimization. Dr. Kyle Gillett, welcome to the show, man. Thank you, Lucas. Pleasure to be on. Looking forward to our conversation today. Awesome, man. Awesome. So maybe, Kyle, do you want to let my listeners know a little bit about your journey and how you got so fascinated into sort of hormone optimization? Yeah. So my background is, you know, I'm from Kansas. I wanted to be a doctor since I'm a little kid. Uh, I think that taking care of people's entire health, including their body, their mind, and their soul is very, very important. And you can't do one without doing the other three. So I went kind of a traditional route, if you will. And uh, I'm an allopathic doctor, I'm an MD, and I went to residency, family medicine residency, and I'm board certified in family medicine. And I hope to soon be board certified in obesity medicine as well. So I'm kind of classically trained, if you will. Really, I'm just interested in health optimization in general. So hormones are one of many components of health optimization. And uh, some people only focus on hormones. Some doctors, some physicians literally only want to talk about everything except hormones and maybe spiritual stuff as well. And maybe psychiatric stuff. So, you know, uh, there's, there's definitely the person as a whole. And it used to be that people's primary care doctor or family doctor would be able to take into account everything that would be positive or negative for someone's health. And it appears to me that that isn't as much the case these days. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's fascinating. The, um, obesity medicine i'd love to no, i'd love to sort of expand upon that and maybe discuss some of the maybe some of the leading causes of let's say metabolic syndrome these days and why that's such a big issue yeah so when you're talking about leading causes of metabolic syndrome i always talk about lifestyle modifications so people ask me about well do i need this pill or whether it's a pill a supplement or whether it's a prescribed medication at the end of the day it's a pill right so I kind of have a uh, big five. There's obviously more and you can add these uh, for a long time, but the big five for lifestyle modifications, these are more powerful than any pill that we can give people. So exercise is one of them. That's both anaerobic and aerobic. So, you know, resistance training, cardiovascular exercise, zone two, you know, all of that is included with exercise. Another one is diet. So that's, you know, any food, preferably whole foods. And uh, obviously people talk about that for days and there's lots of experts in diet. Another one is sunlight. And that's just how your body interacts with the sun and the environment, whether there's clouds or not, even if you live in a cloudy city, there's definitely benefits to being outside in ambient light. Sleep is another one and stress is the last one. So those are the most powerful things in our toolbox, which I often write prescriptions for. Mm, awesome, awesome. So then I guess, um, Kyle, what we can do, let's sort of, go down the hormone optimization pathway and specifically let's focus in on male hormone optimization. I'd love to sort of get your opinion on the use of TRT in, you know, sort of young, young men these days. Like what, where do you stand on that? Yeah. So young is a somewhat relative term in general, when a male is, so andropause is not a medical term, by the way. So these terms like adrenal fatigue or andropause, um, they're not really true medical terms, but they're phenomenons that we do see. So usually I consider men around 55-ish because that's kind of when menopause is for women as well. After that, there, there's somewhat more often idiopathic low free testosterone. So SHBG rises as people age, and that's just a natural occurrence, but free testosterone lowers. And many societies like the AAFP, the American Academy of Family Practice, they actually recommend having a risk benefit discussion for that group of men. So I don't think that that's particularly controversial. I believe your question was more about the younger group of men. So like younger than 50. Hmm. And so that's a complicated answer. And in general, TRT is not particularly beneficial for very young men. Finding out what is causing the low testosterone, perhaps using a strategy to optimize testosterone, whether it's through diet or perhaps medications, while they're 
fixing or ameliorating that pathology, that's also very important. But more often than not, if they have a low testosterone, you can find a cause, whether it's SARMs or metabolic syndrome or sleep apnea. Usually there is a cause and it's not just idiopathic low testosterone. Mm, awesome. So you sort of mentioned, obviously, like some of the causes of low testosterone. I'd love to get your opinion on or get your perspective, I guess, on what you've seen clinically with men that have previously, quote unquote, abused performance enhancing drugs, and now they're on that road to recovery. So what does that generally look like for them? Yeah. So it kind of depends on what happened to their body when they were using steroids, presumably like non-prescription steroids. You know, sometimes people have an adverse effect from medications, whether they're on TRT or a different medication. That's a risk. And before starting them, that's a risk benefit discussion that they should have with their doctor. And that's why I think it's very reasonable that some doctors, which are, you know, perhaps they're not trained as an endocrinologist, if that doctor is not comfortable having that risk and benefit discussion and discussing the significant pertinent risks that are individualized for that patient, then they probably shouldn't be doing, you know, managing any sort of HRT or hormone optimization. So there's, there's a, a high demand, but a very low supply of qualified physicians that can do that. Hmm. So, but yeah, I believe you're asking about the, the cause. Yeah. More so, more so like following the use of these sort of PEDs, how they go about, you know, recovering, what, what does that journey sort of look like? Yeah. So when they do it with the help of a doctor, it kind of depends on why their hormones have not stabilized again. So sometimes people will come to us when they're essentially, sometimes, you know, we're very, we're in a very non-judgmental clinic. I'm a very non-judgmental person. So it doesn't matter if you're, you know, like a circle or you struggle with nicotine abuse or opiate abuse or steroid abuse. You know, if you come to me, I'm going to treat you and try to help you as much as I can. And you can say whatever the heck you want and I'll still try to help you. So um, some people come and they're like, yeah, I never want to touch these again. I had some kidney issues or I had horrible acne or hair loss or even worse, I had a heart attack or a stroke or a blood clot and we'll help them get off in a safe way. Sometimes it's medications. Sometimes it's selective estrogen receptor modifiers. Sometimes they have an adult atrophy. So sometimes they need strategies like HCG, but it's very individualized. However, if we did nothing at all, if people had, again, those healthy kind of like five lifestyle modalities within about 12 months, it seems like nearly everyone, maybe 99%, I don't want to give an exact percent, that's not evidence-based, but nearly everyone does naturally recover their hormone function. Mm, interesting. Okay. So I guess maybe we can dive into a little bit around thyroid health. Obviously, we're looking at optimizing energy and just general vitality for life. Did you want to explain to my audience what the function of the thyroid gland is and, and why it's actually often overlooked? Yeah, the thyroid gland does everything. So it's your general ancillary gland. So it does lots of baseline tasks that uh, you have no idea that it does. For example, it helps with cardiovascular function. Um, it is much more than just a fat burner or a hair loss medication. So it does literally everything. So it's more similar to, you know, sex hormones like testosterone or estrogen. They have receptors in every tissue in the body. And a lot of how it interacts is the sensitivity of the receptor and the thyroid hormone is pretty similar. So when people have suboptimal thyroid lab markers, for example, TSH, free T3, free T4, it is correlated, not necessarily linked in a causatory manner, but it is correlated with poor health outcomes and other comorbidities. So often it's one of the first signs of metabolic dysfunction. It's very interesting as well, because a lot of the cofactors that are needed for the thyroid gland, iodine is well known, which comes in highly bioavailable sources from the ocean. So you can see in concentric circles, you tend to have more thyroid dysfunction as you travel more inland. Mm, fascinating. Let's, let's also dive into that, the dietary perspective. Let's say we're trying to you know, optimize for thyroid function. What are some of the implications of the various you know, macronutrients on 
fire it up or like what sort of influence does carbohydrates and fats and protein have? Yeah. A lot of it has to do with the glycemic index of the food. So one thing that we do know is foods that are high on the glycemic index, especially foods that have high glycosylated end products like chips, crackers, and cookies, even for their glycemic index, they disproportionately glycosylate proteins and red blood cells in the bloodstream. And those tend to have a hyperinsulinemic response. When you have a hyperinsulinemic response, that tends to lower the thyroxine binding globulin and lower the sex hormone binding globulin. So both are produced by the liver. And I think both have a half-life of around one week. So when that happens, you have a relatively high free T3 and free T4, which decreases the negative feedback inhibition at the pituitary. And perhaps this is, I assume that your audience will be into the, um, they'll they'll love this. They'll love this. Yeah. yeah. It decreases the negative feedback inhibition. (laughs) causes continued release of thyroid stimulating hormone. So it causes decreased risk of thyroid stimulating hormone. So it's decreasing your overall, kind of like your total thyroid hormone. So a lot of times that's the reason why doctors recommend mostly going by TSH instead of free T3 and free T4, even though free T3 and free T4 are the thyroid hormones that are circulating, free T3 being more active free T4 not really being active. Think of it as your stockpile. But when your total thyroid hormones are low, but your free thyroid hormones are somewhat low, think of that as having, it's kind of the same phenomenon as someone who has a very low total testosterone, but a high free testosterone. So they don't have a good amount of stockpile. So there's more variability. For example, I've seen people have a free T3 of four and a half, which is quite high normal and a free T4 of 1.7, but they can still have a high TSH. Uh, TSH producing tumors, adenomas are, ex- you know, they're exceedingly rare. So, but it is possible to have that high TSH because perhaps yesterday or the day before you had very low free thyroid hormones. So there's hormone instability or hormone variability where you can take it and it's inconsistent. So diet has a lot to do with that. Mm, that's fascinating. So then let's sort of look at the, the implications of a, a longer, longer term, low carbohydrate diet on thyroid apple. Like what sort of data do we have there? I have not seen very many specific diets, but you know, with the physiology that we discussed previously, obviously uh, having a very high carbohydrate diet over a long term can lead to both atrophy of the thyroid and if you're iodine deficient concurrently, also a goiter of the thyroid. So it's like trying to expand and overwork, but at the same time, it has inconsistent signaling because it's almost too pulsatile. So a lot of hormones from the hypothalamus do have pulsatile release, like a gonadotropin releasing hormone or GNRH, and also the hormone that stimulates thyroid stimulated hormone. But if you're up and down and up and down, then you have mood instability as well. And then it leads to the typical cascade when your neurotransmitters are off. Then when your neurotransmitters are off, like serotonin and dopamine, then your gut's off. So then pretty soon you're having full dysfunction throughout the whole body. So it's all interconnected. Mm, Okay. There's another thing around blood testing that I really want to clarify for my listeners. And that is the importance of you know time of day when you're getting these tests done. A lot of guys come to me and they said, oh yeah, got, got my testosterone checked and it was two o'clock in the afternoon and I wasn't fasting or whatever. So let's sort of look at that. Like in terms of blood testing, ideal time of day and also like why it's so important. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and it's something that people need to talk about more. And even some people, when they get it checked at the doctor's office, it might not be at the, at the optimal time. And usually the doctor will take that into account, but the patient might not know if all the patient has is his or her labs. So for thyroid, we'll talk about that briefly. So you want to stop your biotin supplement probably a week before just to be safe. Like it makes your hair look great, right? But (laughs) uh, it can interfere with the thyroid assay that detects thyroid hormones. If you're on a thyroid hormone, take it after your blood test. That way you're not going to have a weird spike. So, and then also take it fasting first thing in the morning. 
to minimize the instability. Somewhat similar when it comes to sex hormones like uh, testosterone, especially, you want to take that first thing in the day. In general, the younger you are and the lower your sex hormone binding globulin, the more variability you'll have as a with a high level in the morning and a relatively low level in the evening. Interestingly, even if you're a young male that works a night shift, your levels tend to be higher in the morning. So you still maintain some of that circadian re- rhythm or tonic release of testosterone, even if you have you know, a shift work sleep disorder, if you will, which all night shift, pretty much all night shift workers do. But yeah, first thing in the morning, especially for younger men is very important. Something else around SHVG, I want to, I do want to clarify some things around this because again, I get asked this a lot about what are the, you know, what are the functions of SHVG? Why does the body produce it? And then also maybe look at you, you mentioned previously how insulin has a you know, suppressive effect on SHBG. But let's let's look at what is SHBG and what are its major functions in the body. Yeah. So sex hormone binding globulin binds all of your sex hormones. So the more androgenic, the more strongly it binds. So it binds dihydrotestosterone, the most strong, and then testosterone, and then other minor androgens, and then at the very end, uh, your estrogens, like estradiol. So if you have a very, very high SHBG, then it can bind more of your androgens and still relatively less estrogens. Albumin and other binding hormones do bind sex hormones to some degree, including thyroxine binding globulin. It's produced mostly by the liver. Its half-life is about one week. So even you know a change week to week can make a huge difference. The more exogenous thyroid hormone you take, the higher your SHBG goes. So that's one way that you can kind of recover your SHBG. Some people who are having a lot of hormone instability and very low total testosterone, they have thyroid dysfunction. They're not making enough thyroid hormone. So when you give them, you know, levothyroxine or a natural desiccated thyroid, that helps recover their SHBG to a more normal level. So that's one strategy. Other things like metformin can also both increase SHBG and help decrease hyperinsulinemia. So there's a lot of things that you can do with it. In general, the more SHBG, in my opinion, the better, because obviously it's going to alter your free sex hormones. Those are the ones that are binding to the androgen receptor or the estrogen receptor, you know, like the estradiol receptor, whether it's alpha or beta on the cellular surface. But when you don't have SHBG, you're not able to transport the hormone across the membrane. So it can even transport, it has interactions with the nuclear capsid. It can probably transport it across the blood-brain barrier better as well for neurologic function. So it does a lot of various things. It also binds to receptors by itself when it is not bound to sex hormones. One interesting thing that there is a few... There's, there is some clinical literature on SHBG and how it can be affected in hair loss and having a low, a very low SHBG can lead to more hair loss because it'll bind to the receptor and kind of outcompete, if you will, the androgen. Mm. I'm really glad you're touching on these, these benefits of SHBG because again, it definitely gets scrutinized online you know you see everyone's like oh let's take this to lower shbg and and i'm someone who's always looking at those threads and those forums and i'm like i'm lucky because like personally i'm on the high on the higher side and i've always been on the higher side and luckily my total test is naturally 988 uh, nanograms per deciliter so i've worked my ass off to get it this high and so the shbg is also high and also my own estrogen, estradiol is also really high. So I've got the, the full gamut. And even when I tried to manipulate those markers, like just played around with things that would deliberately suppress SHBG, I actually felt worse and I was really confused. I was like, couldn't understand why. But as you mentioned, there are some serious functions of SHBG. Do you also find that when people, so there's a, there's a way that you can calculate your free testosterone using your total and your SHBG and your albumin. 
I've found, and I'm not sure if you've also found that a lot of times it's not congruent and the calculation is way off. Do you mean, cause I mean, I did have my, I had my free T checked as well. Yeah. That wasn't, it was moderately high, but it wasn't as high as I thought it would be. Yeah. So what's this calculation exactly? Basically, you can estimate what your free testosterone would be if your doctor didn't happen to order a free testosterone. If they only happen to order an SHBG, a total T, and an albumin in a CMP, which probably doesn't happen very often, but there's still a calculation where you can calculate it. Mm-hmm. And I've had several patients say, you know, I've calculated my free T, even though we use the accurate assay, the liquid chromatography with tandem mass spectroscopy. And, you know, perhaps their free T is. 28 nanograms per deciliter. And they said, I calculated it and it's really only supposed to be 12 nanograms per deciliter. And I think to myself, well, I got to trust the accurate assay. I'm sure that it's more likely that the equation just is pretty inaccurate rather than the accurate assay is having a lab error. Mm, Interesting. So you also sort of mentioned some of the things that directly suppress SHBG. One in particular that I've sort of been a little bit confused by is the exogenous TRT, each time somebody, you know, sort of introduces a dose of testosterone, you're saying it has a, an immediate suppression effect on SHBG? So injectable testosterone or any injectable androgen will suppress SHBG it disproportionately compared to non-injectable androgens. Right. So kind of difficult to remember, but essentially the takeaway is if you're on testosterone cream versus injectable testosterone, the injectable testosterone will probably suppress it more. Part of that is just due to the peak and trough that you still get. Even if if you're doing, you know, daily injections and perhaps you're doing subcutaneous injectable TRT, then it's still relatively minor and your SHBG is not going to be suppressed as much. Hmm. So that's one way to to ameliorate the decrease in SHBG. It's kind of the opposite for estrogen. So oral estrogens will increase SHBG the most. So whether it's a synthetic estrogen like ethanol estradiol, or just, you know, you're, if you happen to be on bioidentical hormones with oral estradiol, like uh, taking your, you're not using the estradiol cream, you're taking it orally, that will disproportionately increase SHBG which can be dangerous because oral estrogens can also disproportionately increase risk of deep venous thrombosis or blood clots. Hmm. Fascinating. Let's definitely keep on this subject around estradiol because when I was looking into the literature about male libido and male sexual response, I was looking into some of the implications of exogenous estradiol in male rats and when they give these male rats estradiol it literally induces an aphrodisiac effect so let's look at that and what sort of the role estrogen plays in sexual function in men yeah one of the roles that estrogen plays is it helps with fluid retention so if your estrogen is extremely low that can be a rare cause of ed If you're taking something like an aromatase inhibitor, then perhaps it's not as rare of a cause of ED. So that could be one thing. It's kind of similar to the effect where phosphodiesterase E5 inhibitors, although they're vasodilators, they actually increase your libido as well. So they also have an aphrodisiac effect. For example, some women take Cialis or Tadalafil for hypoactive sexual disorder. So, you know, perhaps it's, it was that effect in the rats as well. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder. I've I've also looked into yeah some of those PDE five inhibitors and what they do in the brain and what we have seen. Some of those, like even I think it's um sildenafil. I did see one sort of rat study indicating that it it can increase oxytocin release in the brain. So it could be, you know, people think it's just affecting circulation, but really these some of these drugs do affect other neurotransmitters and neuromodulators, which is pretty fascinating. Yeah, that's definitely true. Each drug has, you know, many different pharmacodynamic effects, what the drug does to the body. And then when you're taking that to account, you don't have to just think about the drug 
as the drug is metabolized, its metabolites will have different pharmacodynamic effects as well. Hmm. Let's, let's definitely dive into insulin and its role in, I guess, overall longevity and everyone's focused on trying to get their insulin in a, as low as possible. I'd love to hear your opinion on what you think is the ideal range for fasting insulin. Yeah. Some of it depends on your diet too, but let's say you have a fairly normal whole food diet, probably between about three and 10 is probably the ideal range for a fasting insulin. The interesting thing is different labs have different ranges as well. And some people have actually started checking insulin almost like they check a CRP or you know lipid parameters to evaluate cardiovascular risk. Some people use a cutoff of 19, which seems quite high for me, for a fasting insulin to assess their risk of a cardiovascular event, like a, a heart attack or an anginal event or a stroke or a TIA. So, you know, I'd say certainly less than 20 for a fasting insulin is a very good thing to have. Keep in mind, if you're on different medications that have like an incretin effect, for example, GLP-1s or amylin analogs like Similin, if you're going to have an incretin effect then that can potentially increase acutely the secretion of insulin, but it also simultaneously decreases your insulin sensitivity. So different things that you're on can actually increase your insulin that are not necessarily, that are not bad for you. So mm -hmm. it's important to keep in mind what your diet is, and then also what medications you're on when you're checking your insulin. If you have a very high glucose, fasting glucose, or A1C, or fructosamine, or glycosylated albumin, but your insulin is very low, that is very dangerous because your beta cells in your pancreas might be damaged. This is really important. I'm, I'm, sort of, I'm really glad you brought this up. Really, really crucial here. Um, some of the mechanisms of action with certain uh, herbal supplements and even with some insulinogenic amino acids, part of their beneficial effect long-term is the fact that they're actually stimulating insulin release and then glucose dependent insulin uptake. So, you know, this is really important. It's really important to understand this for those that are using some of these medications. Yeah. Pretty much any supplement or medication that has a gustatory response or a gustatory response, they increase hormone or signaling cascades that have to do with satiation. So like you get a similar effect by just smelling a food that you like. So they've done studies and they have people eat, you know, the most bland salad you could think of with everything they don't like. And they let them smell something that they love before. For example, maybe smoked salmon. You don't get to eat the smoked salmon, but you get to smell it. And, you know, maybe you can even taste it on your tongue. Tasting it on your tongue, even though you have like very similar chemoreceptors in your nose and your mouth, the ones are more, much more sensitive to gustatory response on your tongue. So some people will even, they'll be dieting and they'll put in a food that they like and they'll just taste it. And that actually does help stimulate the insulin release like you're, talk, like you're talking about. And obviously it stimulates amylases in the mouth as well. And it activates the pepsin, pepsinogen, pepsinogen to pepsin cascade and the rest of the digestive enzymes. So you get better digestion of the food that you do eat. Mm, fascinating. You also mentioned a little bit around um, these GLP-1 agonists, and I'd love to, I think these are definitely up and coming useful medications, and I'm really excited to explore them further in the future. But yeah, explain to my listeners, you know, what are GLP-1 agonists and, um, you know, how they can be beneficial. Yeah. Uh, GLP-1 agonists, though, they're basically very similar to endogenously produced GLP-1 or glucagon-like peptide 1. A researcher, I, think, I believe it was a PhD, just started you know, looking at random peptides in the saliva of, Gila, of a Gila monster. And they ha actually have a, that very si they have a similar peptide to us. Theirs is more similar to exanatide, which was the first one, Bieta, Bidurian were, were the original names. And, but it's a, you know, it's basically a clone of GLP-1. So 
What it does is your body naturally releases it when you have that gustatory response. But when you're dieting, a lot of times that doesn't happen. So it helps you, you know, maintain an even caloric intake. It's one way that your body tells itself other than leptins and adiponectins and ghrelins that, you know, it's full and you don't need to eat. Thank you for eating this delicious meal. So by taking the GLP-1, it's essentially one, telling your body, thank you for eating, even though you didn't eat. And I think I ate a delicious meal. So let's go ahead and digest normally. Let's secrete insulin and glucagon normally. It also causes insulin sensitization in the periphery that helps protect your liver and it helps protect your pancreas. The effect that most people know about is the effect in the central nervous system since it crosses the blood-brain barrier as an appetite suppressant. This is fascinating. Yeah, the Derek from More Plates, More Dates, for those listening in, spoke about the benefits of all the mechanism of action with semaglutide and these other GLP-1 agonists and, and even Vigorous Steve also mentioned things around the potent, potent appetite suppression that people experience. I'd love to understand, a doctor is sort of using this in, in conjunction with metformin and other anti-diabetic drugs, or is it usually on its own? For a patient that's diabetic, it's almost always in the conjunction with metformin. That being said, you know, it depends on how well the patient can tolerate metformin. Both of those medications can cause nausea, usually just in the beginning period. So both metformin and GLP-1 should be titrated up very slowly. Metformin, you're obviously watching for B12 insufficiency. So you're watching for how you're digesting things, how, how your terminal ileum is working, how your stomach is working. But usually diabetics are on both. If they're not a diabetic, unless they have a specific benefit for both of them, usually they're just on one or the other. Mm, okay, cool. Let's sort of, um, let's dive into some of the other insulin sensitizing, I guess, maybe strategies or lifestyle protocols. You, you mentioned obviously stress and exercise, but are there any particular other supplements or compounds that you've used that you think have somewhat decent efficacy in terms of improving insulin sensitivity at all? Yeah, I'm a fan of inositol. Uh, there's good evidence that, so inositol, there's kind of two types, myo-inositol, which has to do more with insulin, helping with insulin sensitivity, and d inositol which tends to be slightly more of an anti-androgen. Chromium is a, an element on the periodic table. It can help decrease blood glucose over kind of more the long run. And then there's lots of other good ones. I'm a fan of psyllium husk. I don't know how much we want to get into fiber, but you can talk about you know prebiotic fiber. You can talk about soluble fiber, which is also known as dietary fiber. You can find it on the nutrition facts label. Those are both great for insulin sensitivity. Mm. So there's always a balance because you can find a list of things that are like that long that really help quite a bit with insulin sensitivity, eating more protein, just slowing down the gut in general. So another thing that GLP-1s does is they slow down the gut transit, which isn't always necessarily good. Alcohol slows down the gut transit as well. But in general, things that slow down the gut transit will increase your insulin sensitivity because you have a, a more even bleed, if you will, of blood glucose after you eat. So Yes, I love the supplements like those for insulin sensitivity. You just remember that you know you don't add those supplements to a faulty diet. Yeah, of course, of course. Previously, uh, I literally just finished filming a video on. I've been on the lookout for some natural GLP one agonists, um, just because that's what I do in my spare time. It's a lot, and uh, th there was one that sort of piqued my interest. It's called Myrocetin. Now, whether or not it has good bioavailability, a lot of these flavonoids, they just really suck with the um, bioavailability and tissue distribution. But I mean, some of the preliminary animal studies seem pretty promising in terms of ameliorating like high fat diet induced diabetes and things. So I'm really excited to see more around the GLP-1 agonism sort of space, which is going to be interesting. But yeah, I'd love to, you sort of mentioned fiber. 
Yeah, what's your what's your stance with fiber? Because obviously, right now the carnivore diet's trending quite a lot. How does what's your opinion on fiber? Yeah, fiber is a very important part of a healthy diet. So it's great for preventing colon cancer. It's also good for insulin sensitivity. It's also good for gut health in general. So you think of kind of the three main classes of fiber. You could obviously break it down a gazillion different ways. But the way I think of it is you have your insoluble or non-dietary fiber, and you have your dietary fiber. So that's what more you think of, you know, like insulin sensitivity, psyllium husk, things like that. And then you have your prebiotic fiber, you know, like garlic, inulin, which is chicory root, if you see that on a, on a label, leeks, things like that. A lot of root vegetables have good sources of prebiotic fiber, what probiotics like to eat. So a nice healthy mix depending on what your gut can tolerate, depending on what you like. But yeah, I, in my opinion, there's got to be at least a little bit. Carnivore diet is great for carnivores. There's a lot of carnivore dieters, and I know a few of them that you know, are proponents of the carnivore diet, but they add in you know, a lot of this vegetable or a lot of this, and they're like, well, avoid the FODMAPs or you know, avoid these. So there's all these caveats. So I guess in defense of the carnivore dieters, most carnivore dieters are not true 100% carnivore mm. dieters. Mm. Yeah, and I'd love to expand upon that is um, with the implications of a severely low carbohydrate carnivore diet on that free testosterone that you know Paul Saladino has spoken about before. Yeah, discuss some of the implications there. Like men, again, pure high protein diet, what implications is that going to have on their free testosterone? Yeah. In some cases we see very, very low free testosterones. In some cases, probably less often than not, more often than not, you know, if you're a true ketogenic dieter or true carnivore dieter, keep in mind that you can eat some foods that are meat that are, that cause hyperinsulinemia. So some meats, especially quickly digested ones, can cause a big insulin response. I forget exactly what they are. I want to say maybe it's like bone marrow is one of them if you eat just that. But some of them do cause a decent insulin response and can lower SHBG decently. But yeah, some people on a carnivore diet, you know, maybe it works well for them. Maybe their total test maybe their free testosterone is normal, but their total is 1500 nanograms per deciliter. So for them, it's not a big deal. But for most people, it does seem like it has a clinically significant detriment. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think definitely one big plus about the carnivore diet is just the incredible array of bioavailable fat-soluble vitamins that we see in time and time again, you know, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin K2. These are positively associated with testosterone production. So that's probably at least they're ticking that box. But my opinion, I mean, my dietary preferences are mostly animal based and then bringing in the carbohydrates in and around training what what is your what is your general like diet look your food intake look like currently yeah mostly paleo diet i try to eat plenty of organ meat and healthy liver i try to eat grass fed meats as well or specifically grass fed beef and bison i like to eat lots of wild game like elk and deer which are plentiful in the area I live in the Midwest. So pretty varied though. You know, I still eat carbohydrates. I still eat processed foods from time to time. But I do try to concentrate on very high quality animal-based products. Grass-fed butter, I'm a fan of. I'm not sure what your thoughts are on like all sorts of organ meat, but some people, you know, they're big into the thyroid and liver and kidney and all sorts of things. Yeah, yeah, I've played around with a lot of different organ meats. Definitely my favorite would be chicken hearts. They just taste so good, man. Yeah. Uh, we live on a tiny bit of land and we have some chickens. So we're looking forward to some healthy eggs and also some, you know, potentially eating some of them as well. Let's sort of, I know you briefly mentioned the importance of fiber for the microbiome. I'd love to hear your perspective on you know, the microbiota and just in general, the microbiome and are there any implications there or any associations with hormone function at all that you've seen? Yeah. 
I guess serotonin is more of a neurotransmitter than a hormone, but that's the main one that I think of. So if your microbiome is diminished or, you know, if, let's say you have C. diff, you're 99.9% sure going to have serotonin issues. So that's the main one I think of. A lot of serotonin is produced in the gut and there's specific species, you know, genus and species of bacteria that are more likely to increase serotonin levels as well. Of course, that's more of a, you know, correlation and not necessarily direct causation, but there's definitely probiotics that are potentially serotonergic. I've always thought, you know, like the people who are, you know, 90 years old, their generation uh, right now, they might have a hundred thousand unique species and, you know, perhaps the younger generations right now, people who are teenagers, they probably have five or 10,000 unique species. Those are some numbers I've heard quoted. I don't know if they're perfect, but I guess the point gets across that there is an extinction event going on. We've kind of already talked about prebiotic fibers, which is how to feed the good bacteria, um, feeding them literally just animal-based products or literally just carbs or literally just processed foods. Think of it as a, a fish tank and you're going to be feeding the fish that you do not want in the fish tank. And those are going to overpopulate and it cause the good ones to die out. Mm, fascinating. What's, um, what's your perspective from like a it's sort of changing topics is more so the anti-inflammatory side of things. Let's say somebody is looking for like just a general anti-inflammatory based supplement. What's your sort of perspective on fish oils, omega-3s and compounds like those? Yeah, there's several good omega-3 supplements. You know, high EPA, DHA is usually what people go to because that study that showed three to four grams of EPA, DHA does decrease cardiovascular risk. So, you know, it's hard to disagree with that study. Hmm. But yeah, I can't remember the exact other ones that you mentioned, but as far as anti-inflammatory, resveratrol is sometimes one of my go-tos. You can take it, you know, without the alcohol in it. Or you can take it as red wine as well. Another good one is ubiquinol. So ubiquinol is kind of a more active form of CoQ10. A lot of people will take it if they need to be on a statin medication. But yeah, I guess my favorite anti-inflammatory regimen would be the autoimmune paleo protocol or the AIP protocol diet. I've heard a lot of anecdotal cases, and I believe there is some small studies that show a significant decrease in flares of autoimmune diseases, for example, Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, without needing to use some of the medications. That being said, there is a whole host of medications, lots of biologics that do work very well. But if you want to try to avoid those highly efficacious meds, that's a good autoimmune diet. Mm, fascinating. I know you sort of mentioned being on statins and needing coenzyme Q10. Let's sort of link in, like explain to my listeners, I mean, is it possible for them to have high cholesterol, but normal fasting blood sugar? Like what's the correlation there with abnormal blood sugar readings and abnormal cholesterol readings? Yeah, I'd say it's a weak to moderate correlation. <laughs> the classic metabolic syndrome patient, if you will, you know, they have pretty severe dyslipidemia, especially high triglycerides. That's more strongly correlated. If you happen to have a very high VLDL, VLDL is also correlated with higher triglycerides. So those are some things that you can, that's kind of like the classic lipid profile. However, there's people with severe metabolic syndrome and perhaps, you know, it's their diet is bad in some ways, or maybe they just have a very low fat diet and perhaps it's genetic. Often it is part genetic. Their lipids look phenomenal. So hmm. a lot of people will say, you know, cholesterol is not the cause of plaque in the arteries. And you wouldn't think that this would be super controversial, but you know, it builds up and it is like a plaque consists of cholesterol. It doesn't cause the plaque to stick. So plaque is normal. Even newborn babies have tiny little streaks, atherosclerotic streaks. So it's normal to build it up to some degree. It's good 
tent education. A lot of doctor's offices now show like the difference between a stable and an unstable plaque because not all plaque is created equal. There's calcified plaques, there's uncalcified plaques. But yeah, as far as the, you know, the lipids of someone that has metabolic syndrome, sometimes they look phenomenal. So it's a relatively loose correlation. You know, some people with diabetes have perfect lipids and you, you ask yourself, well, why are they on a lipid medicine? Because one of the criteria for actually payment and quality, it's a quality measure. And it's one of the main ones is if you have a diabetic patient, are they on a statin? If they are not, the insurance companies will pay you significantly less money and your basically score as a doctor will be significantly less. Statins do have benefits other than just lowering your lipids. So in general, if you're on a statin, the lining in the tunica intima, I believe, which is uh, part of basically the smooth muscle in your artery, tends to be less inflamed. So also there's pretty good studies between, you know, just any diabetic in general and less heart attacks and strokes if they're on a statin. But individualized medicine, you always going to kind of ask yourself, how much benefit is this specific person getting and how much harm is this specific person getting from being on a statin? Mm, fascinating. Yeah, this is this is all fairly new to me and I'd love to dive into one of the biggest drawbacks, I guess, from guys that do go on TRT is the abnormalities that they see with their cholesterol panel. So what is the association there between testosterone and abnormal cholesterol? Androgens act on the liver directly to increase the synthesis of HDL, or sorry, LDL, and decrease HDL. Mm. So estrogens kind of do the opposite. So if you're on TRT with an AI, that effect is especially strong. So yeah, it's essentially a lipid medication. When like any androgen and estrogen is a lipid medication. So um, if you're like one of the people in the camp that I never want to go on any sort of lipid modifying medication, then you definitely don't want to go on TRT or HRT. <laughs> Fascinating. Yeah, that's, um, that's really interesting. But the other side to that is then exogenous androgen administration, doesn't it directly improve insulin sensitivity at the same time though? Yeah, so lots of things improve when you are on exogenous androgens like TRT, you know, hopefully at a very reasonable replacement dose at a nice, even steady state. But yeah, in general, your lean body mass goes up, which in aging males is correlated with decreased cognitive impairment of age mm -hmm. and also less bone fractures. Also, your body fat goes down. So, you know, you have a lot of different benefits from that less pain, less aching joints, better quality of life. You know, there's, there's a lot of different benefits from it as well. The insulin sensitivity versus insulin resistance. A lot of times I think of insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, inflammation, that's kind of like the glue. So the cholesterol is the blocks, insulin resistance, and the inflammation is the glue. So you're not going to make a, a huge plaque wall if you don't have glue, if you just have blocks, right? They're just eventually going to be metabolized. Even if you're LDL is 400. And if you have literally no glue, then uh, you'll be all right. But yeah, androgens kind of indirectly improve insulin sensitivity by giving you the tools to have a better lifestyle, losing body fat, et cetera. Androgens may also directly increase the inflammation in the artery itself, but it's most likely a net positive. That's why it's very important for everybody to have a discussion with their doctor, what effect that something like that would have on their physiology. Mm, amazing. Really well explained. And that's uh, the key point here to drive home is to get your labs checked, get your markers checked and do it under, under the care of a professional doctor like yourself who understands reference ranges and, and different ratios between different hormones. It's really, really important. And to not just stick with the 500 milligrams of test per week, which seems to be... Uh, thrown around a lot. So Dr. Gillard, do you want to let my listeners know where they can connect with you or potentially 
you know, if they want to, I might have some men listening in who want to actually undergo some testing, how, how they can do that. Yeah. So you can find me on Instagram at Kyle Gillette, MD, G I L L E T T. And you can also find me at Merrick health. My bio should be up on the website soon and the bios of our other care coordinators and physicians. And that's M A R E K. So, uh, we are right now we are uh, seeing people who are in the United States only. So, uh, hopefully at some point we'll expand to, you know, Canada and Australia here and there and everywhere. But right now we're in the United States. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'll make sure to link them in the show notes, but Dr. Jill, thanks for coming on the show, man. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, it was really fun talking with you. I hope that your audience will appreciate my passion and that at the end of the day, I only want to help people. You know, I'm just someone that really cares about my own health and I want to kind of convey some of the things that I've learned along the way. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.